Okay, welcome everyone. I'm happy to kick off. Is that right, Isabel? Do you want to take over? You want to start off? Go on, you yeah, start. Uh, just a short welcome. Um, first, introducing myself. I'm Isabel Mendoza. I'm the Global Plan Council Communication Officer, and welcome to the third and last webinar of the Plan Science Based Solutions to Tackle Climate Change series leading up to the 2023 UN Climate Change Conference. Today's webinar will be moderated by Graham Parry, President of the Global Plan Council and Executive Officer of the Association of Applied Biologists in the UK. So, Graham, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Isabel. And thank you, for, Isabel, for organizing these, these three events, which have been uh, really fantastic so far. And I'm sure today will be no different whatsoever. So, yeah, we this is organized by the, the Global Plan Council, which you may or may not know uh, a little bit about. So the GPC is a, a coalition of organizations, a member of organizations across the world that have an interest in, in plant science in some way or another. And we look to focus on promoting activities that kind of cross borders, let's say. So things like, you know, uptake of gene editing technology, um, facilitating access to sequence information in a fair way, and then thinking about how plants are relevant for, for climate change, which is obviously very relevant for this for this uh, little series that we're doing, and on that mat, in that in mind, we we have the GPC has observer status for upcoming uh, COP28 meeting. So Isabel and uh, another colleague will be there in Dubai in a few weeks' time, um, looking to interact with anyone who who is is discussing plant science. So if if anyone on the call is 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 going to COP or has links to people at COP, then um, then let us know, and we will absolutely look forward to to interacting at the at the event. So as Isabel says, um, we have uh, we have two talks, and then we'll have a Q and A afterwards, where you questions will go back and forth um, to either of the speakers. So please put your questions in the uh, Q and A box, not in the chat box. You can say hello in the chat box. Please do. We encourage that. Um, but please put your questions in the in the Q and A, and then we will we will go through those, and everyone will be able to see the questions that guest asked uh, as well. Okay, so um, without further ado, we can we can make a start. And um, our first speaker is is Mark Tester, and Mark's the associate director in the Centre of Desert Agriculture at KAUST in Saudi Arabia, um, and he's also the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Bread Sea Farms LLC, and he's. Uh, his research spearheads innovative stuff looking at um, genetic mechanisms that enhance crop resilience in challenging conditions. And today, um, look through his talk, it'll be very interesting. He's, um, we'll hear about the work on improving salinity tolerance in crops such as rice, um, barley, tomatoes, and and interestingly in quinoa as well, which is hopefully will be a, a, new, a new crop to use. Um, so yeah, yeah, he has he has a vision. It says on my document here, uh, Mark. And I'm sure this is true that your vision involves creating economically viable agricultural systems using partially desalinized seawater, which we'll hear about, and uh, which is pursued through your through your interaction with Red Sea Farms. So, it's absolute pleasure to welcome you today, Mark. And uh, yeah, please share your screen, and we look forward to to hearing about your your research. Thank you very much for your introduction and the invitation to give this presentation. It's uh, it's great to be here and the Global Plant Council is a, a fabulous organization and uh, I'm a, certainly an internationalist if I'm anything and um, uh, when people ask you, oh, where do you come from? I sort of go, planet Earth. <laughs> it's, um, we're all in this together and uh, we have to address global issues internationally. So uh, this is a, a very good organization. Um, I'm uh, going to give you a little bit of a presentation on some of my research and trying to show, just use that as an example of how we can approach uh, crop improvement with reducing the environmental footprint of our food production being the fundal, fundamental underlying. I don't think we need much more food on the planet, but we do need to produce what we are producing much more sustainably. And that's very important. Living in the Middle East, uh, my perspective is focused primarily on water. And we're going to hear from Rob, you know, on nitrogen in, in a bit. 
uh, these are two of the primary limiting factors for growing plants globally. Um, and uh, the use of water uh, for the production of food is absolutely enormous uh, regionally and globally. Uh, so a third of our food, you know, however you calculate these things, but, you know, the generally accepted ballpark presentation is that about a third of the food that we consume is produced under irrigation and about two thirds of the water that humans use globally is for agriculture. And in this region, it's in the order of 80 to 85 percent of all the water that's being used is for producing some food. And like in Saudi Arabia, that's probably only 10 percent of the food that has been consumed. So water consumption for food production is, is absolutely enormous. A lot of that water, perhaps a half of that water that is used for uh, producing that one third of our food comes from underground. It comes from groundwater reserves. And every major aquifer that is being used for irrigation is being depleted. Most critically in Northern India, uh, in Northern India, Pakistan, in the Punjab region, this is highly important. The water levels are going down precipitously. And as those water levels go down, so the quality of the water also goes down. In particular, the salinity goes up. And we need to be very sensitive to these concerns of uh, water, water depletion underground. And anything we can do to reduce the pressure on groundwater reserves, I think, can be helping to increase the sustainability of the agriculture production. Now, of course, there's lots of water on the planet. Uh, the problem is that by far and away, most of it is unusable. It's uh, in particular salty water. And what would be wonderful is if we could develop technologies to unlock that seawater that is so abundant and other water reserves that we currently cannot use to try to help contribute to food production. And we could perhaps increase yields in brackish water-based systems um, and thus decrease the pressure on freshwater reserves, in particular groundwater reserves used for irrigation. So if we're gonna unlock something, we need a key. And for me, I think we're living in an extremely exciting time in plant sciences, in biology more broadly, but let's focus on plants for this seminar. Uh, we've got wonderful technological advances in both genomics and in the phenotyping of plants. So we have what I call the new genetics, where genomics is turbocharging genetics. Just as medicine is facing a revolution powered by genomics, so too is agriculture. And I would argue, in fact, the advances in agriculture are faster even than in medicine. We also, thanks to technological advances, have huge opportunities with phenotyping. I highlight the picture of the drone flying over actually our crop of quinoa here in Northern Australia. This particular photograph is taken, but using drones, digital cameras that have all sorts of bandwidths of sensitivities, Computer power is so much greater now and cheaper, so you can have computer vision approaches to phenotype plants. So the combination of genomics and phenomics, I have called it in, in some of my papers, really does make possible serious innovations. And in particular, I see it gives us opportunities to unlock wild germplasm and access much more rapidly and cheaply the amazing genetic resources, which are still locked away, use that word again, in, in the wild relatives of crops and even in completely wild plants. So we can unlock wild germplasm, I think in two quite complementary ways. Uh, one is to try to get our existing crops and use the wild relatives to make the existing crops more salt tolerant, or, or even and, for these approaches are not mutually exclusive, and we can also get plants which are very, very salt tolerant and turn them into crops. So domesticate new plants, new crops. And these can be the wild relatives that are very salt tolerant, or they can be completely new crops. Though, of course, that pathway is often longer, a uh, longer distance to uh, market delivery. I tried to summarize some of these options in a figure in a paper that uh, published relatively recently. So just draw your attention to this annual review of plant biology um, 
uh, published uh, this year, uh, where this figure summarizes how in focusing on salinity tolerance, but this could be applied to many abiotic or even biotic stresses. Uh, we can use uh, salin we can try to increase salinity tolerance of crops using the intraspecific variation. We can use the cl close wild relatives and we can use more distant wild relatives. And the thickness of these arrows is trying is my attempt to try to represent the re the respective ease of these approaches. So it's easier to use intraspecific variation, it's, but it can perhaps be more powerful, but slower to um, use more distant, crop wild relatives. And we can use a range of approaches here. Um, many of you will be will have exposure to this. You know, there's yield-based selection, there's integration of specific genes that are contributing to a particular trait using marker-assisted selection or genomic selection. There's an error in this figure I've just noticed. Genomic selection should be on its own line. Ah, uh, uh, and then there's also um, another approach, which is, um, it's, it's not original, but it's not used as much as I think it should be, which is grafting. So we can focus, rather than breeding, focusing on the whole plant, we can just focus on the lower half of the plant where the abiotic stresses are more focused in, in the soil. And grafting allows us to focus on the development of rootstocks. This is now a major focus of my own research program. And the mirror image approach is to get plants which are already very, very salt tolerant and domesticate them, turn them into crops. This can potentially give us bigger step changes in the salinity tolerance of the plants uh, that are producing the food we eat, because some of these plants can be extremely salt tolerant and turning them into a new crop may well be easier than, uh, and I think it is, more easier in terms of salinity tolerance and trying to learn how these plants are doing salinity tolerance and transferring that across to crops. So domestication of extremely, in particular, extremely salt tolerant plants is something which we're also doing a large amount of research on in my group. And I'm gonna give you an example of, uh, of how we're doing that in quinoa, uh, which isn't wild, but it's still fairly wild and it's uh, really only been partially domesticated. And we're trying to help accelerate the domestication of those plants. So we can get crop wild relatives or completely wild species and through a combination of genomics and phenotyping, as I've just said, a range of genetic alteration approaches uh, develop salt tolerant crops. And then of course we can also use genetic modification, genome editing, tilling, if we know what we're doing and if we do have particular traits. Now this uh, particular genes that can confer a particular trait. This is um, I think highly profitable approach for some of the agronomic traits. You know, we know about the genes underlying some of the important plant developmental processes, you know, such as shattering, dwarfing, tillering. Uh, but for the abiotic stresses, I think there's still a long way to go for this approach to be really viable. Okay, so this is one example of getting a specific gene and introducing it through marker assisted selection. Uh, work done many years ago in collaboration with uh, the institution that Rob's now at, uh, CSIRO in Australia, uh, work led by Rana Munns, uh, where uh, she actually came to my lab in Cambridge many years ago with two bags of seed and said there's five times difference in the sodium accumulation in these seeds, in, in, in these plants. What's the gene behind that? And we found the gene and we were able to then use that knowledge to integrate that gene into commercial um, uh, wheat and in western countries none of this was adopted so we found fantastic you know, I mean, it was a dream piece of science it was very very nice and thoroughly enjoyable uh, but the breeders in western countries did not adopt it what i'm very proud of is thanks to the work and persistence of richard james who um, is uh, still at csro was a close colleague of Rana Munns, he has uh, been able in collaboration with some fantastic people in uh, Bangladesh, I was very privileged to be visiting um, earlier in the year. Uh, they're introducing this sodium exclusion gene into Bangladeshi wheat varieties, and they're getting good yield benefits in moderate to high salinities. It does depend on the background of the wheat plants, but it gives an opportunity for growing plants, uh, growing wheat, getting a decent crop out 
in between the monsoon season. So the double cropping systems, you know, rice and wheat systems can become more viable in Bangladesh. This gene that is excluding sodium is very interesting because it has no yield benefit in moderate saline soil conditions, but importantly, it doesn't come with a yield penalty. That's essential for these stress tolerance genes not to come with a yield penalty. For me, people say, ah, oh, can you make a drought tolerant plant? I say, easy, you can make a drought tolerant plant. Not a problem, not a problem. <laughs> it's not going to grow very fast. It's not going to give you much yield. It's no use, <laughs> but it's drought tolerant. So you really have to make sure you don't have a yield penalty in the less stressed conditions. And then under the stress conditions, a single gene can give up, you know, in the order of a 25% yield increase. That's really significant. And these results were from our original Australian field trials. Again, I must emphasize, led by Rana Munns in CSIRO. And I was a very happy collaborator with her. And she's a wonderful person to work with. Um, it's a picture of one of the field trials. Uh, but now this work is being reflected and delivered for real to farmers in Bangladesh. So I'm very proud to be a part of that. So that's a, an example of a gene-specific approach in trying to make a, a normal and existing crop more salt tolerant. This is a pretty rare example, though. There aren't that, that many of such examples. And we review this and try to survey why there hasn't been more success um, in, in our review, in annual reviews, because I do think we have to deliver more. So what I want to do now is just show a different approach where we've been getting uh, plants that are already very, very salt tolerant and seeing if we can turn them into crops. And we're doing that, as I say, with a range of species here. We're doing it with the salicornia plant I photographed earlier, and with um, a, a salt grasses, there's various grasses, which have got extreme salinity tolerance that we're trying to domesticate. I'm just gonna give you one example of the work that's most advanced. And uh, we're doing this with other species as well. So with quinoa, a very important crop, it's a crop on marginal lands, you know, when there's nothing else that can grow they can grow quinoa, it's very drought tolerant and it's very salt tolerant and can grow right down onto the shores of, uh, of, of the world's biggest salt lake, the Salar di Iuni and the Altiplano in Bolivia. Uh, and you can see here these you know, people eking out the subsistence existence uh, in a non-irrigated environment here in um, very arid areas in the, uh, in the Andes. It's also a plant with high nutrition. You can eat just quinoa and get a balanced delivery of amino acids in a good serving of micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, which are essential for, for human well-being, for kids to grow well. And this high nutrition is extremely important. You know, the world's biggest health problem <laughs> isn't malaria, isn't TB, isn't COVID. It's micronutrient deficiencies. And uh, there are hundreds of millions of children not growing properly, hundreds of millions of women waking up feeling terrible in the morning for lack of iron and vitamin A and other nutrients such as selenium and zinc. So if we can deliver not just more food, but better quality food, that's also going to make a huge contribution. And the yield potential of chemo can be absolutely enormous. These are field trials that I've been working with in, uh, in the uh, Tibetan plateau in in southern china southwestern china and uh you really can in good conditions with good genetics and good agronomy get a very very high yield per hectare from this crop so the potential is enormous and uh what we have is huge genetic diversity within the species because it has only been partially domesticated and we need to have a whole range of traits improved mechanize the planting and get the crop so it can be planted and harvested more um, more efficiently we need larger grains so you get less loss of grains less shattering just yield of course the bottom line uh crop reliability it's got terrible early vigor uh very poor um establishment uh, or variable establishment rates you need uh dwarfing to reduce lodging you need to reduce the branching so it's sort of i guess my paradigm is is a wheat plant that's primarily my background uh, so if we can turn quinoa into something rather than looking like this, if plants are all over the place, to turn them into something which is much more reliable and um, more easily mechanized, uh, this, is, this is very, very important. It's a dicotyledonous plant. It's often planted at low density because it's susceptible to mildew. 
So you need to keep the airflow through under the canopy. You need to increase mildew resistance and increase herbicide resistance. And then we'll be able to control the weeds. You ask any farmer in the planet growing quinoa, what's your biggest problem? It's weeds. Um, and so having a herbicide resistance in quinoa is a very important thing. Mildew I've already mentioned. And then two things which we've been working on, day length and sensitivity. It's a facultative short day plant. And if you're trying to grow this in, in uh, hot, dry environments, which is my primary target, um, you don't want the plant bolting to flowering four weeks after you plant it. We need to increase the day length in sensitivity and we need to increase its heat tolerance. If we can do those two things, quinoa could, I think, by itself, all of these other things you, one might imagine could work themselves out. Uh, but it, we need to really get some of the fundamentals of the plant uh, better for it to truly become a global crop. Otherwise, she's really going to be sitting at three, 4,000 metres where the uh, temperature is cooler in marginal environments. So we have many approaches to um, improving quinoa. You can use conventional genetics, association genetics. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Uh, you can use conventional breeding, microassisted selection, like that previous example where I showed you increasing the salinity tolerance of wheat. And I think there's huge opportunities for genomic selection where you're examining together all markers in a population. We've got very, I'll show you in a moment, good genomic data. It's got a small linkage to equilibrium, the a massive diversity, the opportunities for genomic selection are really huge. So we're starting to collaborate in, uh, with, um, with some professional breeders who are able to drive this. This is just an example of fabulous field trials sites in, 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 in central China with our wonderful collaborator there, who I particularly want to acknowledge, David Wu, who's been doing this in the private sector. Again, there are many models for doing this sort of work, uh, business models, and he is unbelievable. He's making a business of this and he's been very successful in China. Okay, um, oh, and this photo here, <laughs> Another important person, he's a two important person. This is actually my partner, but also Gabi, she's been growing the quinoa in the field for um, about eight years and really knows how to grow quinoa and has been really helping a lot of people around the world in field sites. And this is one of my PhD students who's now taking up the genomic selection um, approach. This is Clara Stanchevsky, and I'll be showing a lot of her results in the next few slides. So taking an association genetic approach just on principle, I think it's a very good one. You can access broad areas of diversity and especially in a crop with a short linkage disequilibrium. In other words, it's got high rates of recombination, shuffling its genes around a lot historically as well as in a in an in a, in immediate mapping population. It means you can really zoom in very quickly on genes um, uh, uh, that are causing a particular, or at least having a statistically significant contribution to a particular trait. And for, to do this, you need what we call a diversity panel, uh, where you have plants which have been genotyped uh, with moderately high genetic resolution. And, and this is increasingly cheaper now, by the way. So I'm not just talking as some you know, fancy rich person with well-funded research program. This is now increasingly accessible in, in multiple countries. And phenotyping, again, this is getting better and better. And when I was doing some work in, in West Africa, I, people were saying, we can't, do, we, we can't even recharge our drones or something like that. I said, that's okay. Use a ruler. Be proud of your ruler. There's nothing wrong with phenotyping with a ruler and back it up with your genomics, which can be publicly accessible, internationally accessible. It's really very, very good that Garain mentioned international accessibility of um, genomic sequencing. I, I aggressively agree with the essentiality of this. Okay, so you can combine these methods of phenotyping, genotyping to identify loci and even genes that are contributing to the phenotypic traits. So that's what we did with chemo. To do this, you need a reference genome to start with. And this, just those words I just said are actually oversimplistic, a reference genome. This is what people say. You actually need nowadays multiple reference genomes because we have learned that even within a species, you get huge amounts of genomic rearrangements. So we published a genome several years ago of chemo. That was fine. We've tidied it up and the paper got accepted yesterday for version two of this genome. So it's in communications biology. Keep an eye out for it if you're interested in, in quinoa. 
these types of very, very high quality genomes now are being incredibly increasingly um, published. It's, it's very, very easy now. It is. It's easy now to get a very high quality genome. And we do it in one variety of quinoa, which I selected. It's a lowland quinoa because I'm after heat tolerance and those other globally relevant traits, which are, you know, less available in the highland quinoa. So I deliberately chose this. But then we wanted to look at build mapping populations. So we actually sequenced a thousand genome accessions. It's quite interesting because when you sequence a thousand genome accessions, you can start to develop a population structure. And it came out to have a very, very strong population structure in quinoa. These are the wild relatives, which interestingly come out between the lowland and highland. I think quinoa was independently domesticated twice. Um, but, you know, we still need some validation of that. Uh, but what we did was within this population structure, we chose example um, accessions, which sort of looked like normal quinoa that were being grown in commercial fields from each of these different parts of the population structure. And then that's the original QQ74 I chose. And then I chose three other coastal lowland quinoa ecotypes, again, because of my obsession for making this a global crop with heat torrents in particular. Um, and what we found was shocking, uh, in particular on chromosomes 3B, there are massive chromosomal rearrangements. So in fact, I chose very badly QQ74 and these lowland quinoa have a massive um, inversion. Uh, it's, it's around the centromere. It's a pericentric inversion, about three quarters of the genome of, chromos of, of chromosome 3B. Sorry, not the whole genome. Of chromosome 3B is inverted. And that has huge impacts <laughs> when you're trying to do um, association genetics or uh, even genomic selection, because you have to take into account the fact that the genes aren't aligned in the same way in many of the lines. So we've investigated this chromosomal rearrangement in quite a bit of detail now and finding that it's only found in the lowland quinoa and is only found in a fraction of the lowland quinoa. Uh, but we have to know about that. And of course, we can now do a very cheap um, genotyping assay to know if a particular line has that structural inversion or not. There's lots of other small inversions all over the genome, by the way. So we have to be very aware of that. So you've got to get good quality genotypic information. Uh, then you phenotype the plants, so there's rulers, drones, uh, cameras, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then start to do these statistical analyses. Again, they're relatively cheap to do, genome-wide association. The hardest bit's growing the plants. <laughs> um, and uh, so you need to have good environment in which to grow them. Here we're irrigating the plants and we're doing, this is a salinity tolerance experiment, low and high salt in the field and phenotyping the plants. And we've been doing these experiments now for multiple years in multiple locations and you're starting to get things coming out. It's really, really nice. Um, and in fact, I was talking with Clara about this just last night um, about how some of her recent data, which is now we're starting to get into unpublished data, uh, shows good, strong associations in some low side. This is uh, for controlling plant height. And we measured this years ago in another very controlled experiment with collaborators in Germany. Uh, when you start to find these things regularly, uh, it really works out well. Here, Clara found an association for uh, saponins, so contaminants of the seeds, which makes the seeds inedible, means the seeds have to be washed, adds to the cost of production. You can easily remove the saponins. It's a single gene effect. And we actually found that gene also um, in our original paper published in Nature uh, with um, the same gene found using these association genetic approaches. Uh, we can also get genes for, in particular, for salinity tolerance. So this is a salinity tolerance gene which is affecting yield and harvest index, would you believe, with even plausible candidate genes in a very, very small um, um, uh, interval that, uh, that Clara's narrowed down to very strong. That's an incredible result um, to find a gene controlling harvest index. You know, this is like the Green Revolution genes here, uh, controlling harvest index and the maintenance of a harvest index in saline conditions relative to non saline conditions. Love that result. So we'll be publishing some of this. So that's just an example of how you can do this work and you can make it fun. So there's Clara. And there's all the team of people 
that's uh, that's Garby <laughs> uh, uh, being held by one of our collaborators. You know, we, there's always problems with irrigation systems and tanks and so on. And you get the whole lab going out. We all go out and plant together. And um, these experiments really can be done without too much money and with quite a lot of statistical power. Now, how are we going? Oh, I better. How am I going, Mr. Chairman? Couple more minutes. You're abs You're absolutely fine. We we have it okay? lots of time. Right. Here, so you're good. You're good. Because I've got this real emphasis now. My <laughs> my time of career where I really want to deliver this stuff so we can do good science and it's increasingly accessible and we can domesticate new crops. We can get step changes in particular traits or even with new, new species coming in. And we have to deliver this now. And this is really, really important. And there are many paths for the delivery of outcomes. You can do it through startups. You can do it through your local seed companies. You can do it through your local departments of agriculture. You can do it through pharma collectives or Australia, US have got fantastic levy boards. And I think more countries should, should develop these. You can, of course, also go to the majors. They can be sometimes rather lumpy and not so interested in traits, which might be more interesting to perhaps the constituents who we are serving in our particular organisation, in this particular audience. And don't forget a lot, a lot of impact can also be made through education, training, outreach, being an agricultural officer and going out and helping farmers actually get the yields that are potentially on their fields. You can't understate the importance of outreach and these sorts of things. But what I find, and this is another figure from the paper, is we've got two parts of this pipeline, if you like, of this system, which are very well established. There's lots of academic research, lots of publications, lots of stuff being done. It's all, all good stuff. And we've got very good seed companies and good national departments of agriculture. And there's lots of these things over on the delivery side. But the real problem, I think, is moving from this academic research across to the actual delivery. Translating this work often is very difficult. And I think, well, there's there's two things you can try to do to try to jump across this terrible valley of death that um, really inhibits 99% of academic research, some of which could be translated, actually being translated. Um, one, one, way, what, one way you can do this is through your own startup and just get out there and do it yourself when all these other guys don't listen to you. Um, and that's what I've done in my own research and it's turned out to be very successful i mean incredibly successful but it's difficult and it's risky um but i'll just show you just what i've done is start a company it's called red sea um and it's uh it, for my it actually has and this is one interesting learning from what we've done is you don't just set it up with one of your friends or with one of your students you set it up with somebody who's completely different to yourself and that's what you need so classically you have a scientist being set up with a business person. Well, we didn't do that. Well, I set up this company with an engineer, with Ryan Lafers. And then about a year later, because we were being very successful very rapidly, we then brought on a material scientist. Uh, we bought her company. She'd start up a company. We took over that company. So we end up with three different, very different people who've got skills in you know, material science, where she actually developed a heat blocking material We've got an engineer for all sorts of uh, uh, inputs around cooling systems um, and IT monitoring systems, and then my plant science. And these things all back each other up. So my plant science is fine, and it's doing well, and we are making some sales, but we've only just started making sales. My company would be dead if it didn't also have <laughs> Daria with her material science, uh, where we're actually getting multi-million dollars of sales now. Um, around like a dozen countries on five continents. Her stuff has just gone blockbuster very, very quickly. So having different things in the same company, complementary skills or complementary products in the same company gives your company a buffering. It gives you strength and resilience. Uh, and so basically at the moment, Derry is earning it and I'm burning it <laughs> in terms of the money. Um, and that makes for a very good relationship. Um, and then when I say this to her, she says, yes, yes, yes. But I know that my stuff will be 
invent it around, people will either steal it or invent it around it and we'll have competition within 12, 18 months. But it's time my stuff, you know, the plant stuff will be coming onto the market. So we'll be able to back each other up. And that's very powerful. Okay, but don't forget, you can have your ideas. You can develop a new type of rootstock in my particular case, which I haven't been talking about. Um, but then it's still a long way to go. Don't be aware of it. Be aware that it's a long way to go. You have to be testing it. You have to be testing, not just in the lab, but in commercial fields. And to do that, you need to have seed bulking. So you need to be able to get millions of seeds, not just enough seeds that you could grow in your own research greenhouse. You need to have disease resistance profiling. It's absolutely essential if you're taking out new genetic materials. Uh, you have to have registration. You have to go through a formal registration process. It takes 18 months. It drives me nuts, but it's essential if you're going to truly go commercial. You obviously have to have patents. Now, people think they know that, but look where that is on my list. <laughs> that's one, two, three. That's fifth on my list of six things. Uh, of course, you have to have protection, but you know, we, I think a lot of people know that, and that's a relatively smooth process and then you have to get yourself positioned for sales the classic important fundamental thing for any commercialization is you have to have a market <laughs> no market no business and you have to make your product suitable for a particular market we all want to make impact and so i'm desperately trying to do this and so i think we are so this is an analysis which is in my paper which is very wordy it's a slide i prepared just um, especially for this talk but um, it's just my attempt to analyze why this is all so difficult. You know, when you've got these massively profitable, massive multinational companies like Bayer and Syngenta being incredibly successful, what's wrong with us? <laughs> why won't they listen to us? Why won't even smaller breeding companies listen to us? Why do we sometimes have to do it ourselves? I think there's because there's a huge disconnect between what a lot of us care about and what the seed companies care about. So the seed companies are wanting to maximize profits. And if you're a national organization, you want to maximize national yield, CSIRO, for example. And this means that they're going to be targeting big traits for big crops that are going to be inevitably in the higher yield environment. Because a 1% increase in a high yield environment that's a dominant uh, uh, market that's going to be having a nationally a bigger contribution to the whole planet. But the trouble is there's a massive number of farmers. These are humans with families, with children who are living on poorer quality land. And often they're a larger number of people than the people who are on the higher quality land because that's often consolidated big business um, farms. And so if we want to look after the farmers who are still making a very significant contribution to the over, overall total um, uh, uh, national yield, they're often in very large areas, but with low yields, they still need to maintain a business and they still need to increase their yields. And so here's an example of my logic here. And this is using real numbers from the Australian situation from a guy, Glenn McDonald, who did this analysis in Australia. So these aren't just numbers I'm plucking out of the air. If we had a salinity tolerance trait giving a 15% increase in yield, I talked about 25% earlier. So let's just be conservative and say 15% on average, which is sort of the numbers coming out in Bangladesh. So 15% increase in yield. If that's on 34% of the land that has yield significantly impacted by salinity, that's the case in Australia. And on that land, say the yield is about half that of the national average, which is about the case we see in Australia. A 15% increase in yield for this large area of land is only going to give a 2.6% increase in the national yield to the profits of the profit-making companies or of the policymakers. They're going to sit there and go, don't bother. There's no point in doing this. But we're talking about a third of the land and probably half the farms because often those land areas are smaller and poorer. So, you know, if we do that 50% increase in yield for the farmer, that's a 15% increase for those farmers on those poor lands, which is five times greater. The benefit for those farmers is five times greater than it is for the overall nation. And policymakers and profit-making companies don't care about these people who have got less money to spend and from whom there's a lower profit to be made. And this is where we come in, where we have a, we have a I think, a moral duty and we have the technological tools to try to contribute where we can contribute to not just the national outputs but take into consideration improvements in farmers livelihoods and i think that's a 
great thing for us to be able to do. However, we do that, and often we have to do that ourselves. So on that note, I'll be quiet. I'll thank all of the international collaborators which have made my life so interesting and some of our work uh, better than it would have otherwise been. I'd like to thank my own laboratory. who are a wonderful group of people. That's our Christmas party each year here in Saudi Arabia down on the beach. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. Shokran, thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Really, really interesting and wide-ranging talk. Yes, indeed, a, a clap from Rob there. So um, we will move on with Rob's talk, but uh, whilst Rob loads up, let me ask a question myself before we get into the other questions when we have a, a few lined up already. But, I mean, you mentioned about about the quinoa work and, and it was originally grown at high altitude and now you're bringing that down to lower altitudes. Yes, and what, so what's the significance of the fact that quinoa was was originally well it grows at high altitude and what challenges are there bringing it down to lower altitudes yeah i mean there are two challenges one it's often at high altitude and near the equator um so um um actually no that doesn't follow what i was just about to say but anyway it's a short day plant mm -hmm. uh which is terrible because if we want to grow it in a hot environment we want to be growing it through the winter when the days are shorter and so that can lead to bolting and early flowering um or erratic that's often because there's still a lot of variation in those alleles and it's complex control of course flowering um but uh we need it would be great if we could make them day neutral and there are we found a couple of day neutral accessions that's published in our e-life paper mm -hmm. um, and the other thing the primary thing is heat sensitivity because it's cool up there at three four thousand meters yeah. and um we need to be able to uh, reduce uh, this sterility. Um, I didn't show the results because they're still early stage in the laboratory, but I've got a wonderful little team of, um, of three people working on this in the in the group, a postdoc students and technician, and mm -hmm. uh, they're developing the assays for really trying to look at the effect of um, of heat on the um, on the fertility basically okay yeah. yeah i mean so yeah we'll, we'll move on to rob now but just a, a fun note that you know we thought quinoa is this superfood that we talk about but uh it's very interesting to hear uh, that slide about or see that slide about all the the challenges there are otherwise you know they'd be growing everywhere here in in the uk definitely because the, the price that exactly. people get yeah, indeed that's, that's exactly interesting. yeah exactly yes so so I would encourage everyone, you know, if any, if you have any questions about quinoa or remarkable twenty five percent yield increases, to to put your questions, and we'll come back to those after Rob has talked. But let me now introduce Rob. So Rob Allen uh, is he leads the molecular farming team at CRSO Agriculture and Food, which is at the Australian National University in, in Canberra, uh, where he addresses global food security challenge is looking at uh, research on self-sufficient nitrogen fixation. So um, looking forward to hearing from Rob. So Rob, you're going to have to unmute yourself or Isabel can do that for you. And then right, we, you know. There we go. We can hear you fine. So we look forward to hearing about your work as well. Thanks, Rob. Great. Thanks very much, Sharon and uh, Isabel. And uh, this is a real privilege to get a chance to talk about our work to the wider world. So it uh, should be a bit of fun. Um, yeah, so I'm here based in Canberra in ACT in Australia. Um, people might think of Australia being like sort of outback and deserty, but that sort of picture down there, you can sort of see that's my sort of backyard. It's uh, And looking eastwards, you can actually make out a mountain called Black Mountain where I'm actually working below. So on the right there, that's my building called this. Well, it's not my building, but it's where I work. It's called the Synergy Building. And um, that's part of the... Um, the CSRO Black Mountain Science and Innovation Park here in Canberra, where a lot of a lot of there's about a thousand people on site, and a lot of work is done, not just on plant biology, but environmental issues and, and all sorts of things. So, um, in, if you don't know, CSIRO is a national institution in Australia's, Australia's premier science institution. Really, um, it's tasked with um, addressing major challenges that are facing Australia and also the world. And um, and I think the strength of us is that we we, we have such a, a large multidisciplinary workforce, and we can combine to make some to, to address some of these ma major challenges. And, and you know, I've been incredibly fortunate to be in this position where I can. Um, oh, my lights are going out here. Just one minute. Um, 
the um it's it's the building thinks it's home time here but it's actually not for me um anyway um so <laughs> Yeah, so I, like I was saying, I'm, I feel incredibly fortunate to be working for CSRO to, you know, it's it, they've given us the chance to address, you know, like I said, this is, you know, one of the probably the main bio, uh, challenges in plant biotechnology. Um, so I'm very excited about it from from two points of view, I guess, is like, I'm a scientist and like I guess many of you here might be scientists. I'm just a very curious person and I'm, I'm really keen to see if this can work. But, you know, I'm, I'm not here just for curiosity alone, I think similar to what Mark's been talking about, we want to work on impact and work on a real challenge. And I, as the team leader for molecular farming, which we do a lot of different things, this one absolutely is is, is easily the number one. It's it's hard not to get behind this when, and I'll, and I'll go through what the particular challenge is. So um, this is moving along, hopefully. Slides are moving. Uh, here we go. It's just a bit slow. Um, yeah, so yeah, you might be surprised to know that um, there's two forms of nitrogen in the world which are in our bodies. One is, well, they're both the same, but one has come from a factory. About half of the nitrogen in our bodies has come from a factory, and the rest comes from biological processes. Um, and, and Bill Gates and, you know, you know the Bill and William Gates Foundation, they, they're very into nitrogen as well. And it's really underpinned the development of the world in the last hundred years without fertilizer most people or a lot of people on the on the planet wouldn't be here um so it's it's like i said it's a remarkable figure when you think about it but you know we're so dependent upon industrial fertilizer so this is making ammonia from from yeah. from atmospheric nitrogen and that quote there from bill gates pretty much sums it up in that you know we talk about the green revolution and there was obviously plant genetics that underpinned that but it didn't grow out of nowhere. You actually needed an input, and as Mark said, one of the one of the inputs is water, but also one of the other big limitations, as we know, is nitrogen. And biological nitrogen fails to meet that uh, bottleneck for agriculture, and so this has to be met by industrial nitrogen fixation. Um, people like graphs, as scientists, so I think that's shown there graphically as well, where you can see that. You know, since the 1900s, when the Haber-Bosch process was invented, uh, the world's relied increasingly, actually, on feeding itself using synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. And and as you know, you can see there on the on the axis that the world is projected to grow beyond seven billion people, and is is going beyond that already. So, um, you know, we need to think about ways that we can feed the world. Uh, without using a synthetic fertilizer, because as I'll show in the next few slides, it's not. Although it has this, it's it's you know it's increased the livelihoods of people, but it's also got this enormous cost environmentally. So economically, it's very expensive, and and this is partly just due to the chemistry of nitrogen itself. It's got this very strong triple bond, and it's it's very hard to break that triple bond. And so to do this in an industrial setting requires incredibly high temperatures. And it requires a lot of high pressure as well. And that's a very energetically expensive process. And, and this is where it really ties into the environmental cost where, you know, about one and a half percent of the world's energy is just used to make fertilizer. And this industrial process itself creates a lot of greenhouse gases. And you can see there that, you know, you're using about 1.9 tons of, sorry, for every ton of nitrogen you're making, you're using about 1.9 of, tons of carbon dioxide. And and like I said, the the manufacture itself is is quite prohibitively expensive, and it's almost tripled in the last uh, decade, just simply because of demand and also other global events that are occurring. Now, this is talking about a commercial sense, but obviously in places like sub-Saharan Africa, where subsistence farmers don't have really access to fertilizer, this is a real problem. It's not you know livelihoods are dependent upon access to fertilizer. Yields and yield failures can result from not having enough fertilizer, and so you know there's there's clearly a need to have this press this problem addressed from from simply an economic point of view. And that it would be great if we could enable a technology where you could have a plug and play crop like a like a, a system a, a seed that farmers can have access to that they could use, which isn't actually requiring an import of fertilizer. Where this 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 seed itself. And the plant is capable of fixing its own nitrogen 
And that that's the goal, and that's, I, I guess, what gets me out of bed every day. Um, from an environmental point of view, it's also not great. Um, uh, you know, it, you might have heard of fertiliser runoff and algal blooms, and, and on, on the left here is a photo showing, I think, uh, from around about the time of the Beijing Olympics in 2008, when the entire sailing regatta was was under threat because the the sea round there was getting uh, so much fertilizer runoff that you know people had to crew up to get rid of the al algae that was a consequence of algal blooms and and this is not an isolated thing of course this is just an example a photo but you know uh, fertilizer blooms and and toxic uh, runoff can can be you know deleterious for entire river systems so so not only is making it expensive and creating greenhouse gases but the, just using it itself has leads to these other problems. And then there's also the problem of denitrification. So nitrogen itself, uh, you know, a byproduct is nitrous oxide when it goes through the soil. And that's actually that gas is 300 times worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So clearly, you know, a nitrogen uh, fertilizer, ammonia, uh, it's, it's, it's got its pros and cons. Obviously, it's very good for agriculture. We need it, but it comes at a huge cost, both economically and environmentally. So we want to really try to see whether there's ways we can reduce this. Uh, sorry, I didn't forgot about this slide. This is actually showing a bit closer to my own home here, and it's a bit further north than where I live. This is up on the Great Barrier Reef, and we have colleagues in Oceans and Atmosphere at CSIRO who have prepared this image from satellites, and they can actually look at the algal blooms that are leading out to sea. And we have a lot of sugarcane farming up in the north of Australia, and that requires lots of additions of fertiliser. And, and, and that, again, can lead to problems on the Great Barrier Reef as well. So, you know, you can get coral, coral bleaching, really. So that's, you know, and that's almost, you know, one of the jewels of the crown of Australia is the Great Barrier Reef you might have heard of. And so, you know, we really want to try and prevent this from, from happening and reduce it. So um, the good news is, is that um, nature is always better than humans, although we are, part, we are nature products as well, I should say, better than factories. Um, so. So nitrogen itself, or, or the production of nitrogen in a factory is, like I said, it's very energetically expensive. It uh, requires a lot of pressure, a lot of temperature, but there's a beautiful enzyme in nature called nitrogenase. Uh, and, and it's been around for a long time. Um, actually before there was much oxygen around and, and there was a lot more nitrogen. And it could actually use, um, uh, it could do the process at, and it can do the process at ambient temperature and at one atmosphere. And this is all around us. There's these things, there's these bacteria in the soil called diazotrophs. And this is where half, the other half of the nitrogen in our body comes from, from biological nitrogen fixation. So I can see here that, you know, the notion of, well, can we actually make this, as, is there a way we can harness this enzyme to make fertilizer? It's quite an attractive notion because as you can see, the, the, the factory notion of, of making nitrogen fertilizer is, is very expensive and energetically an issue, whereas nature has this beautiful enzyme or, or an engine, you might want to say, it, it's, it's already there, but it's not existing in plants. So, so this comes to the question is like, can we actually engineer nitrogen fixation? And like I was saying, there's, there is a subset of bacteria called diazotrophs that fix nitrogen. And, and you would have heard of symbiotic nitrogen fixation. So there are some diazotrophs, a class of subclass of diazotrophs, and they actually form symbiotic relationships with plants, some plants. And so they're giving plants nit fixed nitrogen, and the plants give the bacteria some sugar. But unfortunately, that's not the case for most plants, or most, most crop plants. I mean, obviously, there's the legumes and soybeans and things which can do it, but you know, crop, uh, crops such as wheat and rice... They can't fix nitrogen. So, so, you know, the goal here is can we find ways to get these crops themselves fixing nitrogen or otherwise have a relationship with the bacteria that can give it fixed nitrogen? Now, it, I'll, I will spend some slides later on talking about the, the actual problem, the complexity. But I think, you know, with again, with the good news is, is that, you know, this this does sound like an audacious challenge because it's quite a complex enzyme, as, as I'm going to re reveal soon. Uh, it requires all these specialised cofactors. It's oxygen sensitive. But, you know, I, I'm living in pretty exciting times, and Mark was talking about it too with, the, you know, genomic resources we have, is that, you know, now with advances in synthetic biology, the ability to make lots of DNA cheaply um, and, and, and stack lots of genes together, 
I think we're at a pretty good time when we can start to address some of these, you know, this challenge and, and we're actually doing it now. So I guess that's what the rest of my talk will be about. So I guess there's uh, three major approaches to this problem, um, to engineer biological nitrogen fixation. And I have already talked to you about symbiotic relationships. And so one of the one of the um, one of the goals is to try and simply get a crop plant and to make that, that that doesn't fix nitrogen and to make that like a plant that does fix nitrogen. And this is shown an example here with uh, you know with clover to, to sort of turning that into wheat. Now this is not my field, and I actually find this incredibly complicated as well. In fact, more complicated than the approach that I'm undertaking because you're talking about two different organisms here and trying to make them play together. And what I've come to understand actually is that nitrogen fixation itself, even in legumes and close relations to legumes that don't fix nitrogen, is under intense negative selection because nitrogen fixation is very energetically, energetically expensive. So it's not very easy to convince a bacteria to give nitrogen to a plant. In fact, there's these bacteria called cheaters, and they'll actually tell the plant that they've got nitrogen fixation, that they've got some ammonia to, to give the plant. They'll send the signals and then they won't do it. So, you know, that is part of the reason that this is under negative selection, which makes it hard to imagine that we can turn a, a wheat plant into a clover in terms of the nitrogen fixation ability. Nevertheless, I think this is definitely worth doing. I think the problem itself is so great and the payoff would be so enormous that I think it's worthwhile looking at all these different different ways of getting in uh, biological nitrogen fixation in plants. Uh, the, 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 the second way is that there are um, bacteria that more loosely associate with plants. They're not necessarily in symbiotic relationships. And there's been a lot of work at trying to get plants to actually send signals to those bacteria to make them start releasing ammonia. And there's also been work at the other end to, to engineer those bacteria to give up their nitrogen. And again, I think this is, you know, everything here in this space is audacious. And I think that's particularly audacious in that to make nitrogen or to make, to fix nitrogen in a bacteria is very energetically expensive. So to convince that bacteria to give up that fixed ammonia freely is, is, is quite a, quite an effort. And so, so there's some interesting papers in that space. So the third way is what our, our team is working on. And this is more of a direct approach. And this is actually putting that beautiful enzyme, which I showed you that video of before. And the idea is to put that directly into plants. So we're endowing the plant itself with the ability to fix nitrogen. And, and this is actually not a, a very new idea at all. In fact, um, back in 1972, uh, there was a guy, Ray, Ray Dixon, who's actually, he's a legend. He's still in the field. I've, I've had the pleasure and the honour to meet him at conferences. Uh, and he's still working on this as well, and other people are obviously working on this. But but back in 1972, what, what he did was to transfer nitrogen fixation from a diazotrophic bacteria, so you know, a, a bacteria that can fix nitrogen, and he put it into E. coli. And E. coli doesn't fix nitrogen, and but it was able to but was able to fix nitrogen with this gene cluster from the from the nitrogen fixing bacteria. And so that was an enormous result. And it basically showed that you can actually transfer pathway and a very complicated pathway, I should say, there were 18 genes within this pathway. The nitrogenase gene cluster is around 25,000 base pairs. So this is pretty amazing gene engineering back in 1972. And so you can imagine at the time then it was thought that, well, you know, wouldn't this be good to do this in the plants? And well, it, it is good to do it in plants, but there's obviously a lot of differences between an E. coli and a plant cell or a yeast even, which other people are using for models. So, and that's some, you know, I'm going to show you some of these challenges we're facing. But I just wanted to say this this idea has been around for a long time and it has only been relatively recently when we've really, you know, had these tools, like I said, the Synthetic Biology Toolkit and some of the past experiences we've had in using that successfully that has really, I guess, fired up the community to go, well, you know, let's actually make this happen and let's make it work. So, so getting back to the complexities that have sort of almost dissuaded these attempts previously is that it's not a simple pathway. To make nitrogen fixation in a bacteria it requires the coordinated action, depending on the bacteria, between about a dozen to 20 or more different proteins. 
the final uh, engine you'd call, which is called a uh, NIF DK, because it's a it's got two two components, requires the coordinated biosynthesis and and um, of, of different proteins to make metal metallo clusters, and also complicated metallo clusters. In fact, the metallo cluster in in nitrogenase, the main nitrogenase contains molybdenum, and it's considered one of the most complex metallic clusters in biochemistry. So you know you could you can see you know a lot of these things. People might say, well, why are you even bothering doing this? And hopefully, I can show you throughout my talk some of the work is well actually because we're doing it and we're getting some traction in this space. But I, I just wanted to be realistic as well to show that well, yeah, this is what we're up against. It's not a simple gene pathway. And when I started in my, my sort of journey in molecular biology and plant molecular biology and genetic engineering, we were doing things like single genes. We could put that into a plant. We could make more of it and we could get a product and that was all good. Um, this obviously hasn't been done before, but we are doing larger genes. So here within this very building, within the Synergy building, we've developed omega-3 fatty acids in plants. So that's a complicated pathway, seven genes in that pathway. We've made super high oleic fatty acids in, in canola, and that involves uh, silencing genes and adding other genes in. So, you know, we have the capability there to do this, but, you know, this is obviously the, ne the next level. And and it's obviously not just us doing this. Other people around the world are very keen to get this working. Because like I said, if we could, you know, if we can get this working, even, I'm not saying we can replace fertilizer, but even if we can reduce the amount of fertilizer that's needed, it would have a huge benefit to, like I said, to, well, to the world. So how how are we considering going about this and, and, and what's special about what we're doing? Well, the, the key for our approach here is we're actually going to target, or we are targeting plant mitochondria. And, and you might ask, well, why, why are you bothering doing that? Well, there's some really cool things about plant mitochondria. I guess one thing that I like from my old genetics background is that they're actually very evolutionary related to the bacteria that fix nitrogen. So as yes, you know, the, the theory about mitochondrial evolution and, and actually what that means is some of the proteins that are in mitochondria, particularly those in, involved in iron cluster assembly, are also in nitrogen fixing bacteria. In fact, we have proteins in us and humans in, in, in our mitochondria, and they're actually called NIF-like because they were discovered in nitrogen fixing bacteria before, but we have equivalents within our mitochondria. And so, you know, that's that's one reason. But the main reason actually is that as you know, mitochondria, that's where we make our energy and, and energy is made by consuming oxygen. And so it's actually a, an environment that consumes oxygen. And that's absolutely important because the big problem with nitrogenase and what has really dissuaded attempts and people said you can't do it is because nitrogenase is oxygen sensitive. So oxygen can destroy nitrogenase because it evolved two billion years ago before there was much oxygen around. But what gives us hope is that it's still around now and bacteria have actually worked out ways to protect it from oxygen. We need to think about how we can use those similar mechanisms in plants. And so, in fact, if you look at nitrogen-fixing bacteria, there are some that actually speed up metabolism. So they're doing exactly what mitochondria do. They're, they're basically just making more ATP, burning more oxygen to protect nitrogenase. Finally, I get this question asked a lot. is like, oh, well, what happens if you get ammonia toxicity in plants? Like, you know, you get an ammonia in there and it's going to poison the plant. And I say, that is just, that would be the best problem to have ever. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I'd just be happy to see any ammonia. But the point is that there's enzymes there that can assimilate that too. So glutamine synthase is in the in the mitochondria. And so, you know, you can see why there's several, several reasons that mitochondria are a target location. And I should also stress that it's not the only location people are looking at. We're also looking at chloroplast as well. And I won't go into that now because that's another path, but... Uh, mitochondria, for the reasons I've, I've talked about, just has this uh, really good promise as an ideal location for nitrogenase assembly. So what do we need if we go into mitochondria and what are some of the prerequisites? And and, and I apologise if some of this is a little bit biochemical, but I think it's also it's a pretty cool story. So um, And please just ask more questions at the end of this if, if I need to explain things better. But um, when we're targeting things to the mitochondria, it's like we need to put a postage stamp on that protein to say, go to the mitochondria. And so the first thing is to target is we need to actually synthetically engineer 
our nitrogenase proteins with this postage stamp, and it's called a mitochondrial targeting peptide or an MTP. And it's actually got to travel from the cytosol through to the mitochondrial matrix. So it's got to go through a number of different transport proteins. The second thing that has to happen is that the, the protein needs to be soluble. It's no good if it sticks to the membranes. And we can assess this by just looking on a, on a, on a protein gel and we can, we can split up the different fractions and we can see what's, what's in the total fraction, what's in the insoluble, what's in the soluble. And then we can actually assess whether it's processed, that is whether it's actually got in the mitochondrial matrix, because then we can we, we simply look at the size of that protein. And so when it's actually processed, there's, a, there's an enzyme in here, which you'll hear a bit, a bit more about, called the mitochondrial processing peptidase, and that actually cuts the postage stamp in half. And because that's then a smaller protein, we can then look to see that that smaller protein has been made. Now, because these are synth synthetic proteins as well, and we've modified them to go to the mitochondria and we've added bits onto them, we're not sure how that's going to change the function of the protein as well. And we can test that. So we can go back to our friend E. coli and we can put that modified version of the protein in there. And then we can so this is a bit like, you know, Ray Dixon's E. coli that makes nitrogen. Only we're putting in a version here sometimes which has a modification. And then we can test that to see whether that modification will at least be allowed. So they're the prerequisites. And we have some pretty cool tools as well to, to, do, to do this. So as you can imagine, uh, because we have so many different genes and so many different proteins, we have mitochondrial targeting peptides, we have different versions of proteins, there's a lot of things we need to test. And so we need to make lots of different genetic constructs. And we're using Golden Gate cloning for this. And this is a this is a really cool way to sort of stitch genes together. Um, our, our lab rat of testing for plants is, a, it's actually a native tobacco. It's called Nicotiana benthamiana. And it actually grows in the middle of Australia natively. And what's really cool about this plant, we call it benth, is that you can actually infiltrate a, a construct in there. So a genetic construct, as you can see here in the picture. And within five days, you can then assess whether that protein has been expressed. And so this has incredibly sped up our, our workflow, really. It makes things quite stressful because we can do things on a Friday and we want a result by the next Thursday. And that's our workflow. We're, we're literally sort of trying these things in this, in this cycle of synthetic biology, which is we design things, we build them, and then we test them, and then we learn. And this is what we've been doing. Like I said, we have our E. coli system for functional testing. And... I don't know how much I'll go into this I might, if I've got time later on, but like I said, the nitrogenase enzyme is oxygen sensitive. So when we actually get to the pointy end and assess function, we have to do this anaerobically. We actually have this chamber here called an anaerobic hood. It's actually a bit like a, a mitochondria in that sense and that it's consuming oxygen. In here we have oxygen scrubbers and then we can purify proteins and then we can assess their function or within this environment. And what do we get? So what have we seen so far? Oops, sorry. Well, back in the early days, well, not so long ago, I guess, well, you know, a few years ago, we had to just basically see whether our mitochondrial targeting peptides work. And we, we had some success there where we fused our mitochondrial targeting peptide to GFP. And we assessed to see whether this was traveling through to the mitochondria. And we saw co-localization co with our targeting peptide of choice in the mitochondria. And we also saw the, the, the processing as well, which is indicative that it's getting cleaved by the mitochondria. But, you know, we're not interested in putting GFP in plants. We're actually interested in putting nitrogenase in plants. So then we went and tested a whole lot of different nitrogenase proteins. You saw that pathway before. And these are the things we need to have working. So they need to be, if we go back to those criteria, they need to be processed and they also need to be soluble. Most of the proteins we put in were correctly processed although not always. And we have controls here where we can assess this by looking at a, a version which already makes the right protein of a process size and we can assess the mitochondrial size compared to the control size. And usually that was okay, but in some cases also we'd get an unprocessed protein, which probably meant it wasn't quite getting through to the mitochondria. So it wasn't like, you know, biology is beautiful. <laughs> uh, a postage stamp isn't enough for the protein to get to the mitochondria. It's not a universe, it's not, doesn't work like a real postage stamp. It actually just, you know, depends on the cargo as well. And so I've actually learned a lot about processing as well. So we have tried different mitochondrial targeting peptides and generally we have had success with 
targeting these proteins to the mitochondrial matrix. Solubility, again, is uh, another issue uh, where initially we found that, sorry, I'm just trying to move this thing around. Uh, again, some are really troublesome, like NIF-B, which is really important. The version we originally used, we didn't get any soluble fraction. In fact, some of, a lot of the proteins we wanted to use, and this is the initial screen, we were finding that, you know, they're just not soluble. And, and what was really interesting is a lot of this was just due to sent, sent into the mitochondria. So if, the, if we put these things in, into the cytoplasm, they might be okay. We go to the mitochondria and they're saying about that environment that doesn't help. And that, that you know, when, when a protein is insoluble, that usually means or can mean that this hasn't folded correctly. So, you know, something about the, the, the import into the mitochondria or, or you know, th there's, there's a million things that could potentially have, you know, affected that solubility of that protein. And this is, like I said, this is our first, our first sweep. And then we did the uh, tolerance of that mitochondrial targeting peptide scar sequence to see whether that was functionally tolerated. And, and generally, it was pretty good. Not always. So I think, you know, in this in this first survey about, you know, the question was, well, can we target all these proteins to the mitochondria? Are they soluble and are they processed and are they functional? The answer is it depends. Uh, and that led us some work to do. One of the very big problem children was NIFD. And NIFD was very important because that's the actual structural enzyme. So NIFD and NIFK are involved in, in, in doing that catalytic reaction. And we pulled our hair out over this one because it not only was it not processed very well, and you can see this by the double bands here showing processed and unprocessed protein, we we're also getting protein degradation as well. And 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 we weren't really sure why we we're getting the protein degradation. And we tried all, all sorts of different things. So we took an approach, a molecular approach, to try and determine how the degradation was occurring. Was it occurring specifically or was it occurring generally? I think at this point, I'm going to cut a, a very long story short and let you know that we worked out that the NIFD degradation we saw, and this, I guess, illustrates it here. If you look at th these are versions which go to the cytoplasm and these are versions which go to the mitochondria, where you can see the cleavage product, it was pretty clear that the act of targeting the protein in the mitochondria itself was leading to this degradation, which was actually surprising to us as well because you can actually predict based on the cleavage of that mitochondrial peptidase, what proteins should be cleaved. And this wasn't actually meant to be one of them. So then we did some more symbiotic uh, uh, synthetic biology magic, and we made a lot of different variants where we could change that region where we saw the protein being cleaved. And then, well, firstly, I should say, when we looked at that region, it was a, real, it was a bit of a conundrum to us because when we discovered the region where this protein was being cleaved, it also happened to be the most functionally sensitive part of that protein. So that was a bit of a catch-22. It's like, well, that's great. Even if we change amino acids in that region, that still might affect the function of that protein. Again, we relied on synthetic biology and made a lot of different constructs. We looked at processing. And then we found versions which weren't um, that, that weren't, uh, reg they weren't cleaved, but also were functional. And so, you know, this, this relied on a lot of computer modeling to sort of determine what the structure of the protein would be with these changes and then functionally testing that. And so gratifyingly, we found a version that was not only resistant to mitochondrial degradation, but was also functional. And so this solved one of the key bottlenecks towards making an active nitrogenase protein in plants. Um, one final task remained though with NIFD. And as you could probably see here, we were still getting unprocessed NIFD. In fact, most of it wasn't being processed. And, and for that, we took a different strategy where we actually fused it to its partner because uh, this, and, and this is still a, a rather unknown question for us is we don't understand, but the facts are that when we fuse NIFD to its partner, NIFK, we get better processing. So you can see here with NIFD, it's, it's, uh, you still get this doublet here showing unprocessed, but with the, the, fu the translational fusion proteins, we could we could actually get uh, a, 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 no unprocessed and totally processed protein, and also it was still functional too with the changes to the um, to the cleavage site. And so this is a sort of a diagram diagram of that oh, diagram of that here, where we made a model and it was quite it's it, we're pretty happy about this. It's almost like a world record in terms of how much 
size of a protein you can get to the mitochondria. So, you know, the mitochondria normally splits proteins up. So, the you know, ATP synthase in us is made of subunits. And we reason that probably because there's a, you know, a, it's got to go through this pore called the transporter of the outer membrane. And we've managed to squeeze this fusion protein in to the mitochondrial matrix. So, um, you know, that's a very, you know, I guess a good good avenue for future functional work in that we can get this protein there where before it was just simply being cleaved and degraded. Solubility was also a problem for other proteins as well. So NIF-V was another other, other protein that is an essential, uh, it's an essential protein to make homocitrate, which goes into that complicated metallocluster I was telling you about. And for this, we took a different approach in that we didn't do synthetic variants. We, we turned to natural variation. And this is a theme not just that we're taking, but others are taking as well, in that, you know, um, there's, there's beautiful diversity in nature for nitrogenase. There's different environments that nitrogenase-containing bacteria live in. And so we, we looked at bacteria that looked at all sorts of different environments, and we could screen them again using synthetic biology. And we found a version that was not only soluble, shown here, but also functional as well. So the insoluble versions didn't, didn't make homocitrate at all, but the soluble versions did. So that was quite encouraging. Um, but finally, one of the other, I guess, issues is that's sort of scary is that there's just a whole lot of these different nitrogenase proteins that we have to put into the mitochondria. And, you know, I'm a pretty simple person. I like to go for a simple thing. And we're very fortunate that um, Ray Dixon, again, you've heard of him before, he, he looked with uh, Yi Ping Wang in, in China. They looked at minimizing the cluster to the simplest form possible that would still fix nitrogen in E. coli. And they found that the iron only nitrogenase, so a sort of a, a simpler type of nitrogenase, was capable of fixing nitrogen with only 10 genes. And so we've actually been focusing on this particular pathway. It doesn't use molybdenum, it just simply uses iron. It's not quite as efficient, but we're happy to trade simplicity for I guess what you might say efficiency or turnover because we don't really care about that in plants. That's a bacterial problem. And so that's a recent publication of ours where we put the iron-only nitrogenase within plant mitochondria and we've now found this interaction between the the you know the, the enzyme st structural units, so NIF-D, NIF-K and, and, and NIF-H. And we're not operating in a vacuum. We're very lucky. It's a cool field, nitrogenase engineering, and we have some great friends over in Spain. In fact, they came and visited us recently. This was down in Adelaide. We had a had a conference, and and what's really encouraging is that, you know, um, I think this, you know, even though we might be working independently, we're all working on on components of this nitrogenase engineering, and we all we're all really wanting to make this work. And and over and and so like I said, some, some of our friends are working on proteins such as NIFB, and they've managed to isolate that from plants and show function, and also NIFH. So the, you know these are key enzymes which are involved in either the maturation of those metallo clusters or actually the catalysis of the enzyme. So NIFH is you know the key electron donor, and we've also I haven't shown you everything that's been solved here, but you know some of these early components we've looked at for metal cluster loading. And, you know, now the real challenge is focusing on making this active NIF-DK in plants. So in summary, I think, again, we're in a, in a good time where advances in synthetic biology, they've allowed us to tackle one of these super grand challenges, which is to get nitrogen fixation in crops. Um, but, you know, not surprisingly, you try these things and, and not everything works. So, you know, we can target most of these things to the mitochondria, but several of them aren't welcome because there's, you know, mitochondria haven't seen uh, a nitrogenase protein, you know, maybe two billion years ago. It was sort of, you know, we've, we've removed things in that that great evolutionary distance. And I think that's a really cool finding that, you know, when you put NIFTA into the mitochondria, it's it didn't it didn't evolve to have a mitochond to not have a mitochondrial cleavage site. And so that's why it's being cleaved. And but I guess gratifyingly, it's also a story that we can again use our approaches in in, in synthetic biology to overcome these barriers, and, and that can be through synthetic variants like I've shown, but also through natural variation like I've also shown for NIFE. And and now it's it's good that you know some of these components are being stitched together, and now it's about you know assembling that entire pathway to try and get the function within plant mitochondria. So I hope I haven't 
probably did go over time, but I'll just leave it at that and say very a very big thank you to everyone. Again, I've got a great team to be in. Um, we are spread a bit throughout the country. We have collaborators collab 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 all over the country, so we can't all be together. Although we did manage to get our, our dogs together, which is good. And um, yeah, so very happy to take any further questions. Thank you. Thanks so, <clears throat> thanks so much, Rob. That's really, uh, really interesting stuff. Let me just quickly uh, come in with a, a chair's privilege of a, of a question. So, I mean, you're you're trying to engineer plant mitochondria, and mitochondria are pretty similar across, well, relatively similar across all plant species. I'm I'm guessing, but do you have a particular target in mind in the you know the crop in which you'd really like to get this nitrogenase working? <clears throat> Out. Uh Y yes and no. I, I, we're, so, like I said at the start, we're we're working on proof of concept, which is using um, the Australian native tobacco, Benthiniana. Yeah. Um, but we could think of any number of crops we'd like to go into. Um, the cotton industry in Australia is very reliant on inputs of fertilizer, um, but globally, you know, maize again, um, wheat's a bit of a tough one because that's you know the GM space is a bit hard around there, but. Um, you could pick, and I did. I left my slide out, but you could pick. You know, there's so many different crops out there that are dependent upon, heavily dependent. You know, more than fifteen to twenty percent of their cost is fertilizer, and so I, I guess we are a little bit agnostic at the moment. Um, CSRO does have a very good relationship with the cotton industry here because, you know, it's basically one of the best you know industries in terms of like the, the not using pesticides because it's GM. Um, but that has its challenges as well to, to introduce things in there. So, um, yeah, but I'd like, you know, my point of view personally is I'd like to see the technology be widely deployed. You know, yeah, I guess wherever. you're you're doing the challenging part of trying to get it into the mitochondria and then once you have it in there, then in, well, in theory, then, of course, you could put it into all plants, you know, given absolutely different physiologies, of course. But, uh, yeah, sure. yeah really, really interesting stuff. A great strategy. So we have a we have a few um we have a few minutes that we we can ask there's a few questions come in so thanks for those people who've who've done that so let me um loop back to mark first of all and uh there's a question from Matthias and he asks whether your research will mostly benefit the quinoa production in areas with high with heat and salinity stress or also in more temperate areas in Europe or North America as well what's where, where the focus is on what you're doing yeah, that's a good question. Um, the the direct sort of primary research that we're doing in our lab now is definitely targeted for the 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 high temperature saline environments. Uh, so that's the direct answer. But we're doing all this genomics as well, and we're making it all completely publicly available. Um, everything's already all available, and more importantly. We're making the germ plasm available as well. So I have a technician who spends, I don't know, maybe a quarter of her time or even a third of her time packing seeds into bags, pack, patching up, doing all the paperwork and posting them off. So we're sending the seeds um, globally with the genome sequences, and that's generic. Um, so how people use that will be relevant for their particular environment. Um, yeah, I guess you're trying to go, you, you're doing the hard stuff first, almost, you're not just bringing it down in altitude, but also growing it in a place where it's, where it's more saline as well. So whereas you know, it might be easier, I guess, to bring it down in altitude and, and grow it in a non saline stressed environment. I don't know. Uh, well, well, but, 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 but why I chose quinoa in the first place was because it's already very salt tolerant. Now that doesn't mean it can't be made more salt tolerant, but it's already, yeah. it's amazing. Okay. Uh, okay. It, it grows doesn't even feel it at concentrations where rice is dead <laughs> okay um so it's it's pretty salt tolerant already yeah okay. okay cool okay so this uh we've got a question for for rob here from aman uh asks do you think nitrogen applications can enhance the molecular response of plants grown under abiotic stress specifically heat so once you get those nitrogenase in there whether you would have my other impacts as well on on the physiology of plants yeah i mean look that's a good question and it's a pretty hard one to answer um i think you know that 
put it this way. Um, plants spend a lot of energy scavenging nitrogen from the soil, um, you know, when it's limiting. And so if it comes back to energy, I'm not sure whether this is a little bit off reservation on the question, but I, I believe the plants will find a way um, because they'll trade, trade. you know, it's a, they make these decisions, these trade-offs between what's the limiting factor. Um, so whether or not it's going to have a yield penalty in a, in a drought-prone environment, yeah, it de depends on what the limitation is in that particular environment, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenging one to to answer. Certainly, I will. I will say this about cotton, though, and uh, just sort of an interesting side point on that, though. And you talk about how how different things can can affect the you know a plant in a different environment. Is that you know GM GM cotton is actually better. It's more drought tolerant because what they find is that you know the insects that don't eat the plants, so the plants aren't getting eaten as much. And so they're not investing that energy into the regrowth and they're putting it into it. So, you know, in, in that regard, you know, you can actually have a trait that produces this unexpected benefit, or maybe not unexpected, but so, yeah, how that's going to play out with nitrogen fixation if the plant's, you know, not having to worry about scavenging for nitrogen as much, it can make its own, mm -hmm. then you know, that might have an energy benefit for the plant, which can lead to other benefits as well i'm not sure but yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a good question mm -hmm. so mark coming back to you um we've got a question from babak who asked about uh salicornia salicornia sorry um and there's more uh, was also a halophyte but are you doing any work on that looking at how um that might compare to quinoa uh, yes, yes. Uh, Salicornia actually is another one of our target okay. species. Um, with it's t like a lot of these things, like Rob describing all of these, just frankly incredible molecular, hardcore molecular biological things that has to be done to get over nitrogen fixation. I can say, hey, I'm going to domesticate Salicornia. <laughs> and it turns out to be much more complicated than I could have ever imagined. And part of that is because you're getting variable ploidy levels in the wild salicornia species, mm -hmm. um, and you're getting incredibly dynamic genomes. It's it's actually a nightmare. <laughs> um, and uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're doing the same sort of narrative, the same story as we've done with quinoa, uh, with salicornia, and we're doing it with multiple species. Um, and trying to screen, if you like, uh, species which are going to have the most potential for domestication in terms of you know getting bigger seed and um, having the agronomy worked mm -hmm. out. So somebody asked in the chat box, why get rid of branching if you want to increase yield? But you know that you, you want to get rid of branching because you want to be able to have a smaller number of very productive tillers, the lower branches, which come along later, are often very small. So the plant's putting a lot of biomass investment into something which then doesn't produce that much grain. It can also be harder to harvest because it's a lot lower down. And um, if you put everything concentrated into one, one head, then you can plant the plants at high density. That's why mildew resistance is so important because then you can plant plants at high density, have less airflow. That'll be cool um, for having the plants get through to maturity so um for salicornia <laughs> we're looking at, at species which are going to be you know, like they're, they're, there's one that everybody's worked on called salicornia bigolovia it's an auto tetraploid <laughs> and it, it suffers inbreeding depression after about you know three or four generations of inbreeding it's 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 not the right one to go for it attracts attention it's got the biggest seeds at the moment but let's look for a plant which has the potential to produce bigger seeds into the future or even set up breeding systems where we can get heterotic groups or even go for generate allo polyploids i mean what's the most successful crop on the planet it's wheat it's a it's an allo you know, hexaploid it's, it's spectacular so why don't we just get inspired by some of these other um other crops crop systems and see if we can set up and i'm talking 10 20 year program for this one chemo was relatively <laughs> easier but um for salicornia we set up a program where we've got the 
best opportunities for in the long term uh, trying to get um, a, a new crop into the system. So yeah, yeah, I, I love salicornia. And it's an amazing plant because it's got this ability to like accumulate over one molar sodium in its photosynthetic tissues. Uh, there's no other plant on the planet like it. And so we've also got an academic research program where we're trying to understand what the proteins are that are responsible for that high sequestration. And again, one of my fantasies is to make a transgenic rice that can accumulate um, at least in part some of the sodium because rice is very salt sensitive. And uh, part of that is it's very low tolerance to the accumulated sodium. So the difference between salicornia and rice, it's like a factor of 50 fold mm -hmm. difference in sodium accumulation that can be tolerated by the tissues. That's amazing. So yeah, we've got that academic, sort of more academic, although I've got an applied output, but it's possibly I'll be dead before we. A see little, that. Yeah, a little. I mean, <laughs> this is this is this is what we're seeing with with many things that uh, the you have to have the ideas, but the actual uh, getting it into practice is is extremely challenging. We, I think, we've seen that from both of your your talks that uh, yeah, you know you're, you're you're doing fantastic work in your particular areas, but mm -hmm. you know, moving it along is 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 the big challenge. And and you know, watch this space, I guess, over the next I don't know. 10 years or 20 years ago. who knows but uh yeah okay so i think you know we've kind of kind of come to the end of our scheduled time so i think we're gonna we're gonna draw it to a close i mean i know rob and, and mark are extremely busy gents rob, mark was telling us before that he's on the road a third of the year so the fact we've managed to nail you down for an hour and a half is is, is great in itself but um you know we're very grateful for your for your contributions and as as isabel said this all this the talks are going to be they're available on on youtube um so people can go back and, and and have a look if if you miss missed anything and let me ask you to you know go to the gpc website we have other webinars coming up and other activities ongoing so always lots going on with 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 gpc and hopefully you can you can engage on these things so thanks very much isabel is there anything else you'd like to add i think i think we're okay no no uh i think we are good to go we are five minutes over time so okay. thank exactly. you so much for all for your attendance and for uh, thank you for uh, the speaker for your time yeah nice. thank you thank you everyone and we'll see you see you again soon thanks guys thank you bye bye, bye, -bye. see you at cop isabel see you there <laughs>